The opinions, viewpoints, and beliefs presented on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the management, the affiliates, and broadcast partners, or the sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. Between science and ignorance, there is filler. Good evening, listeners. This is Wes Forsyth, host of Paranormal Filler. Today is February 7th, 2016. Welcome to the first hour of Paranormal Filler. The first hour is brought to you by LiveParanormal.com, the paranormal social community with live interactive broadcasting, and sponsored by Ken Boggles House of Cards. HeroByKin.com Of course, today, if you're not paying attention, uh, is Super Bowl Sunday. So, really all that means to the show is that most of the people that don't listen on Sunday nights because of The Walking Dead are listening or not listening for a whole entire another reason. My guest tonight on the first hour is Margie Kerr. Uh, she is a sociologist that studies... Fear. I will remind you to stay tuned to WIHGRadio.com for the second hour, 9 p.m. Eastern Time Zone. Scotty Rourke, Spooky Scotty will be with me for the second hour. Margie, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for having me. Everyone, uh, now first of all, Margie, I got to tell you one thing. I screw. I mean, it's a good thing you don't. You're not on Twitter anymore. Um, <laughs> when I announced you coming on the show, of course, I did it. I do my show announcements a lot of times uh, bright and early, farm time here. Uh, it wasn't even daylight yet, and for some reason, I typed in that you were the psychologist that studies fear. And immediately my Twitter follower said, oh, this will be fun, Wes talking to an actual psychologist. But no, everyone, I hate to disappoint you, she is a sociologist, and I'm a social person, so this should go quite well. Yeah, but, yeah, it's it's often um, mixed up, and I do teach psychology classes and do a lot of uh, research, um, you know, in psychological issues, so th- there's a big crossover, yeah. So, uh, first of all... Uh, Tell us where, of course, you now you've written a book. Um, I've got a, the science of fear. Mm-hmm. Um, chilling. Oh, I'm sorry, it's chilling adventures in the science of fear. The book uh, Scream is the short title, uh, apparently. Yep. Um, so, what is your? Give us the core of your research. 
so I, uh, I am a sociologist. I've been doing research in fear, uh, for the past eight years. My longer history, my academic, um, research has focused on kind of a, a wide span of social issues. Uh, but in the past eight years, it's, you know, been more explicitly focused on fear. So I have been collecting, uh, data from, uh, people who you know, purposely go out and seek thrilling activities. So generally, you know, thrill seekers, um, trying to understand why they engage with scary and thrilling activities, uh, and what they get out of it. So for the past two years, I've been collecting data at a haunted house in Pittsburgh called Scare House. Uh, and, uh, for the, I guess probably around seven years previous to that, collecting a lot of survey data uh, just from customers online uh, and uh, on site and in person. And then for the past two years, I've also been traveling around the world uh, doing as many scary and thrilling things as possible, uh, which is largely what the book is based on. My adventures uh, in Japan and South America, all over the U S um, riding roller coasters, going to haunted houses, haunted spaces, and then uh, writing about that and connecting it with the most recent literature and research in academia to, you know, try and explain why we do these things. Now, in your um, um, scarehouse research, now do you do you like question people when they come out of the building? Do you do do you follow them around? Do you watch them on hidden camera? <laughs> How does that work? Because um, most of the uh, the uh, commercial haunted houses that I've been to it's it's kind of a whirlwind experience and uh so I'm wondering how you how does that work for you yeah in the, particular? Uh, the way that we do it we our approval uh from the university is based on recruiting people who have already agreed to the experience so uh we recruit people who are standing in line and uh they come into our lab we have a lab set up on site uh, and they answer a, a whole bunch of questions, uh, and then we have them sit through a series of, of tests uh, while they're um, being measured uh, with the, uh, EEG. So we have mobile EEG, which records and uh, reports brain activity. Uh, so they sit through about a 15-minute um, series of tasks while their brain waves are being measured, uh, and then they go through the haunted house, uh, and then they come out and we ask them a whole bunch of follow-up questions and then do the same task, uh, measuring their brain activity again so that we can look at the change from pre to post. Uh, and then this year we started collecting, uh, EKG heart rate and, uh, skin conductance, um, or how sweaty sort of the, the palms get while they go through. So we have reports on, how their body is responding to the haunted house during the experience, in addition to the pre and post uh, questionnaire. So uh, we're just starting to look at that data now, and it's already uh, pretty pretty exciting and interesting to see what's what's happening in people's bodies when they're scared. Do um now this is something I'm just guessing, but now do the is do the people that come in beforehand and tell you that. Well, I'm the big tough guy. No, this kind of stuff doesn't scare me. I'm just here for the chicks. Uh, do those, does their fear reaction, um, medically, scientifically, does, are those people actually braver or at the end of the day, do their palms sweat just as much as everybody else's? Well, I, we haven't looked at those types of personality characteristics, uh, and their, their, you know, physical responses. Um, we, we have, we have scales that we assess, uh, people's level of sensation seeking and thrill seeking, but it doesn't really tell us whether they, you know, believe that they're going to get scared. Um, I know that from, you know, from previous studies done, uh, people can sort of steal themselves or prepare themselves for something scary, like a scary movie or a haunted house, uh, and basically, you know, decide not to be scared by constantly reminding themselves they're in a false environment and, and, you know, go through and, and, um, and just kind of shut down their, uh, their fear response. But when it comes to reacting to things like startle scares, it's pretty, uh, difficult to, to not at least jump or, um, you know, have your heart rate tick up a little bit when 
there's a, a big flashing light or a, a burst of sound. We're so hardwired to respond to those spontaneous and unexpected uh, stimuli that, um, you know, our body is going to, to respond. Now, I, I believe that 100% because when people, of course, I'm in the paranormal field, and people ask me what my scariest experience was. And honestly, my scariest experience was completely not paranormal. It was simply a human being catching me off guard and they got scared and they screamed and it sent, I mean, the, the little hairs on the back of your neck, the whole, the whole nine yards yeah. made me curse. And I mean, it really, that startle factor really did catch me off guard because on top of not really worrying about the paranormal, I'm also because I'm out in front. I'm the 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 host, the um, the personality on these hunts. I try to put up a strong front. I don't want to be the run dude guy. I don't, you know, <laughs> run out of the building like a little girl. Yeah, yeah, and it's you know our, our body is is amazing. We have this, uh, you know, this kind of alarm system set up that is always watching out for, for different things that could potentially hurt us. And, uh, and it has the ability to pick up on cues in the environment before we're really cognitively aware of them. So, um, you know, as soon as, as something picks up a vibration or, you know, a, a flash of light or a sound, uh, before we can even think about it, our body is already responding and putting into motion this very sophisticated, uh, fight or flight response that just makes us, um, kind of revert to our more primal animal self where we just want to protect ourselves or, uh, you know, run. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, I, I'm not sure I'm going to word this next question right, but, um, that, that was something that I was wondering about. Fear itself, since that's a study of what you're studying, we'll use that as a big umbrella word. Mm-hmm. Is fear more of an emotion that triggers a chemical biological response in us or is does the chemical biological response come first and triggers that emotion that we call fear that's a great question that's actually something that a lot of uh researchers have debated about you know which which came first is the uh you know the the body or the mind and and it really can happen um, kind of sim- simultaneously and uh, and you know in, in both directions. So our our physical response is uh, can be triggered by by name. I mean, just tons and tons of things. It can be something in the environment, but we can also think ourselves into a state of of panic or fright. Um, and so a lot of what we call fear, the emotional experience, is in the meaning making. It's in the the way that we are thinking about this experience, that's when we, we start to call it fear. Uh, when we're just looking at the physical response, um, researchers typically just call that the, the high arousal response or the threat response. And that's sticking to the, the things that we can measure. So our heart rate, our, um, you know, or even our hormone levels and looking at what the body is doing. But when we start thinking about, okay, well, was this experience scary? Was it traumatic? Was it, um, you know, maybe fun. That's all the, the kind of second part where we start building a, a meaning around it. So that's why we can enjoy things like haunted houses or commercial haunted houses, uh, because our body is in that state of fright. But cognitively, you know, our, our rational mind is saying, oh, well, we know we're safe. So we can kind of hijack this threat response and enjoy it because we're not really, you know, in a dangerous place. Now, if you're, out, you know, in the middle of the night in a dark place and you hear something, that certainty of safety is gone. So it's going to be, you know, more real fear rather than um, uh, just, oh, I'm in a fun place. I can enjoy this. Everyone, you're listening to Paranormal Filler. My guest tonight is Margie Kerr, the sociologist that studies fear. We'll be right back after this commercial message. TarotByKen.com Unlike other tarot readers, Ken reads multiple spreads during each session to provide you with clear, concise answers and guidance. Don't take my word for it. I'm just a voice on the radio. 
from Kelly. One reading with Ken completely changed things around for me. Jennifer, I feel so rejuvenated about my life. Melissa, it has changed my life. Visit tarotbyken.com to arrange your own tarot date, or you can call or text Ken at 859-229-4833. And paranormal filler is paranormal filler is back with Margie Kerr. Okay, Margie, now what do you have any insight into why we even want to be scared in the first place? I would yeah. think primevally, I mean, you know, the fear. Okay, I understand self preservation is a good thing, but fear is if you made a list of bad emotions, most people would put fear in that column. What draws right. us to be afraid? Yeah, and this is the the question that has motivated me for many, many years now because I think it is interesting. Here's this very uh, negative idea, this negative emotion, but yet we seek it out in so many different ways. Uh, and what I've found is that, uh, you know, there are lots of benefits to voluntarily engaging with scary things, whether it's a haunted house, a scary movie, um, a paranormal investigation, a roller coaster ride. Uh, there are a lot of benefits, you know, physically, everybody always talks about the adrenaline rush and it's, it's not really so much the adrenaline, but the endorphins that are released when we're afraid. Uh, those are our body's natural painkillers and they do, um, you know, work towards making us feel a degree of euphoria or at least blocking us from experiencing any, any pain. Uh, but there's other, uh, chemicals in our body that are, can make us feel good. Like dopamine uh, is released when we're going through the the threat response and serotonin too, which a lot of people are familiar with because of its link to depression. But serotonin is also released when we're uh, stressed. And um, so just from a physiological level, there is a, a natural high that we get from these experiences. And lots of people have talked about that before. Um, and it is really interesting to see what's happening in the body. Recent research shows that some people uh, may get a bigger kick the, from the natural high. Their bodies may be uh, producing more of the, the feel-good things like endorphins and dopamine. Um, but there's also psychological benefits to challenging ourselves to do something that we're afraid of. Um, just like any personal challenge, when we tackle something, uh, when we get scared, when we get stressed and we make it out the other side, uh, we, we feel a sense of accomplishment and it's a very real sense of accomplishment. Uh, even if the experience is fake, you know, we know we're not going to get hurt in a haunted house. Um, but we still feel like we challenged ourselves and, uh, overcame, uh, uh, you know, an obstacle, you know, the, we know that the horde of zombies isn't real, but it, it does feel like we have achieved something because of that uh, evolutionary kind of reward. You know, we're, we're wired to, uh, feel good about pushing ourselves to that physical, uh, extreme and, and making it out the other side. Um, so we feel like we, we're, we're more resilient. We, you know, just challenged ourselves. We overcame. So we feel more confident. Um, and, uh, when I went, um, skydiving or, you know, lots of the different thrilling things afterwards, I did have such a sense of confidence. Like, I can do anything, you know, and, and I still think about that now when I'm in a difficult meeting or having a, a you know, confrontation with a coworker or something. Uh, I think, wait a minute, you know, I hung off of the edge of the CN Tower. I spent the night at Eastern State Penitentiary. I can face anything. Um, so that's a, a very real benefit from it. Uh, and then there's also a lot of social uh, rewards from doing scary things together. Um, when we're with our friends and we face a challenge, uh, we navigate it better and build stronger social bonds with the people that we're with. You know, it is true you do feel more closely bonded to people after you go through something stressful or scary. Um, so that's a, a real, uh, can, can be a real benefit too and why people like to watch scary movies together and, um, you know, it's seen as a, a bonding kind of friend time. So, so lots of reasons, lots of benefits to voluntarily engaging. And, and the key there is volunt- voluntary. Um, when we are, you know, forced to, to experience something scary, uh, it generally, uh, doesn't end up being very much fun. But when we choose it, when it's on our terms, then there's a lot of uh, growth and, and fun that can come from it. I guess I'm an underachiever, um, <laughs> in the fear category. I, 
I don't seek fear. I, I'm not a big fan of horror movies, which is really mm-hmm. tough being in the line of work that I'm in, uh, because a lot of people I talk to, you know, that's, they live, eat and breathe horror movies. But uh-huh. it's not that, you know, now I watch them sometimes, but even when I watch them, it's, um, I don't know if I tune it out or what, but, um, the, I only like so much fear. In other words, right. I don't, I don't like, uh, uh, worrying about what's going to happen when I turn off the lights. Now, I can remember back when I was younger and they didn't shake me up so bad. Now, I, I did like roller coasters. Uh-huh. I, don't, I don't remember that liking them for the fear. Um, but maybe that's what it was. Maybe I just interpreted it a, a different way. Um, but so I, I can, in other words, I can relate a little bit, but are there, is, is there a sociological, psychological reason that many of us either, I don't even want to say avoid fear. It's almost as though I turn it off. And I don't mean that as being brave. I mean, mm-hmm. it's something that I just don't seek out. And, uh, and like I said, it, I, I kind of click that little response off in my mind. Yeah. Yeah, there there are a lot of people who who don't like the sensation, the physical sensation of uh, of being scared, and um, there you know studies do show that there are differences between individuals and in, in how our body responds to stress, and um, and that's and it's okay, you know. And I always tell my friends who don't like scary things that you know I'm never going to force them to do something uh, scary because. You know, they're not experiencing it the same way and they, they don't get the same kind of, uh, rewards from it. And, um, it's completely normal. It's just kind of a variation of, 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 you know, human experience, whether or not you, you like it. And, um, and there's a lot of difference in, um, you know, what types of scary things people like. I talk to a lot of people who love thrill rides, but hate scary movies. And, uh, and it's all, you know, just a, a issue of, of preference. Often previous experience is going to weigh heavily into what people like and don't like. I always tell people, you know, it's, um, uh, it can be a, a personal kind of discovery to, to see what kinds of anxiety inducing or fear inducing things you, you like or don't like. You know, if you watch a scary movie and you think, okay, I didn't like the anticipation that I felt right before the monster was going to jump out. Or is it, I really didn't like the content of the scary movie. I you know blood and gore are really gross and uh, I just don't like that. And, and it's just a, um, you know, a issue of preference and figuring out what, what you like and what you don't like. But yeah, a lot of people, they, they'll feel that growing anticipation or the suspense and, and it's uncomfortable. It's just not a sensation that they enjoy. Well, I know, uh, now, now here's one for you. I'm going to use my wife as an example. Um, do you have any any input into this sounds like it would be a very similar situation but my wife is essentially afraid of the dark she oh. will she doesn't like to go outside the home without i've got a 500 watt floodlight in our yard uh mm-hmm. she uh you know she's fine if i'm around but you know she she's just not she she is afraid of the dark until until okay now this is going to tie into the next segment when we go to a allegedly haunted location this woman will stomp around an old building in the dark alone with people doesn't matter um big flashlight little flashlight no flashlight sit in the dark for hours no fear how can we how, how does a person make that disconnect between Something that honestly should be safe, my yard, versus mm-hmm. a place that is, you know, kind of geared to scare you. Yeah, it can be so context uh, specific. And, you know, the um, person's personal history is, is going to really influence a lot of that, too. But we do have such powerful uh brains that we can we can essentially kind of compartmentalize and say okay well this is a safe environment for this experience and this is not a safe environment so you know it, it could be that the context of um you know doing a paranormal investigation in in this this place with you know this setup we we kind of 
put that in one folder in our brain and say that's that's fine, that's not scary. Uh, and then in another folder we have you know the woods or um, you know a, a cornfield. For me, I think that you know cornfields are, can be terrifying um, just because you can lose your sense of direction so easily. And uh, but you know if I was in a, a different context, you know corn a cornfield is not going to be scary. So it it really can depend on the um, the way that we're we're making sense of the experience and what we're bringing into it before we even get there. Okay. Uh, yeah. To me, to me, she's she's still upside down because now here's my confession for haunted locations. Um, when I'm in the moment, maybe the startle factor, but. Uh, I cannot remember anything ever scaring me. And I'm, and I am, I'm the guy that puffs out his chest, you know, and, and if somebody says they hear a noise in a room, I'm the guy that runs in the room. Mm -hmm. But now at the end of the night, when we're tearing stuff down, and I'm the guy that has to walk in and, you know, lock the, the far end of the doors by myself, I can't, I, I've caught myself walking just a little bit faster. Yeah. Is it possible to be for a person's fear to really, I'm, I think I'm afraid of being afraid. I'm not, I, I, in other words, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. That's what, uh, a, a lot of people say, you know, it's the, the anticipation of something scary is where the real fear is. And, uh, that's when our body starts going into our threat responses when we're anticipating something potentially threatening. Um, so it, it, it can really, um, we can get ourselves sort of worked up just by thinking about what could potentially happen uh, rather than being afraid of what's actually happening. It's more this fear of the future potential of, of threat. Um, and uh, a lot of it again is going to be based on what we're telling ourselves beforehand, you know, like, okay, I need to be kind of strong and in control and, and have everything together for this investigation, but maybe there's not as much kind of focus on, kind of being in the in the moment when you're just you know cleaning things up at the end of the night your your guard is maybe not as uh not as high now what uh what brought you to my attention was i was going through my uh, calendar of events that we post on the website paranormalfiller.com everyone paranormalfiller.com um and uh you are booked at the spirits of the bay at manresa castle a celebrity uh ghost hunt type event now, uh, now is this uh, something that you're fairly new to? I know that you've been to the haunted houses, but now mm -hmm. how much have you done in haunted houses? Well, I've been to many, many, uh, you know, haunted places. So, mm -hmm. um, I've spent tons and tons of time at, at Eastern State Penitentiary, uh, including, um, spending the night there and, um, exploring the property and, uh, staying in one of the, the punishment cells underground. Uh, and I've been to, um, you know, Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum and the Moundsville State Penitentiary, uh, a whole bunch of places up in New England. Uh, so I've been to lots of, of haunted spaces, uh, and I've gone there with a, you know, aim to understand, uh, what is unique about these spaces that draws, uh, people to them to do investigations. And, um, so I, my background is not so much in paranormal investigating with, the equipment and going in with the kind of um, techniques and, and things that uh, that investigators do, but rather approaching it from, you know, a, a sociological uh, perspective, being um, more kind of objective and trying to figure out what's what's happening in these spaces that make them, uh, you know, um, locations for, for ghost hunts. And uh, so in that respect, I, I can speak to the, you know, reasons why these places become, uh, popular destinations for ghost hunts. Um, but this will be my first time speaking at a, uh, at a paranormal event like this. Okay. We're going to, uh, continue this topic here in just a moment. Everyone, you're listening to Paranormal Filler. I am a believer. I'm not talking about the paranormal right now. I'm talking about PC-Matic. Nothing ever lives up to the hype. 
Like you, I've seen the TV commercials for PC Matic. Since I obviously have to rely on my computers, I decided to give it a try. Now, do you have an older computer running maybe Windows XP? I do. And it's running like it's fresh out of the box. As a matter of fact, I've installed PC Matic on all of my Windows desktops. And yes, I can tell the difference. So, if your computer is running slow or crashing, or if you just have to rely on your computers like I do, go to my website, paranormalfiller.com, click the PC Matic banner, and then try one of their free scans. PC Matic, for speed, stability, security, you won't be disappointed. Welcome back, everyone, to Paranormal Filler. Margie Kerr, a sociologist, is my guest tonight. Okay, Margie, we're talking about haunted, actual haunted locations now. Um, in my definition, I'm not sure it's going to be your definition because you have a apparently scientific mind. Um, now, when is this? Okay, you've been to a lot of these places, but now I'm going to make the assumption that you started with the roller coasters and the commercial haunted houses before you moved into the paranormal side. Um, I, it, I've always been a fan of, you know, scary and, and spooky places. So even as a kid, I was always going to explore abandoned you know, areas and, uh, I loved ghost stories. I loved, uh, thinking about the paranormal. Um, so, so I've always been a fan of the, the kind of scary, spooky thrills and chills, uh, writ large. Um, so, but my first paranormal investigation, uh, I would say my first very kind of official, you know, professional one, uh, was, was just a couple years ago. Um, that had, you know, I went with a group who, uh, brought lots of equipment and they had a photographer and, uh, all of the different types of readers and the, um, you know, different, uh, grids and, and, um, blinky lights. I got, yeah, <laughs> that was a, that was a fun, that was a fun experience. Yeah. The, um, uh, you mentioned before, you know, what makes, a allegedly haunted location is scary. Now, I, of course, my gut instinct, because I am a believer, is the ghost. But I have a funny feeling that's not where your research takes you. What, well, um, what are some of the, what are some of the elements that you think make some of these big famous locations anyway? Um, well, I'll ask it two ways. Do you feel these locations do you feel these locations actually do draw an activity that is not explained in the real world? Or do you think it's all, pardon the expression, smoke and mirrors, and we're setting ourselves up to be scared in these locations? I think that, um, you know, one of the, the great things uh, about science is you know, we, we can, I, I fully support continuing to look for, for evidence of, of ghosts and hauntings and, uh, and, you know, I think that that's an exciting area to continue to explore. Um, I think that a lot of the places they become these destinations because uh, they have uh, a lot of things in common. Usually, they are places um, of historical significance, so they're very old. Um, and when we stand or are in uh, the presence of something that is very, very old, like a um, you know the Eastern State Penitentiary, or in this case the the castle, uh, which was built in 1892, there, there is this sense of awe that we experience when we recognize like this, this building has stood the test of time. It has been witness to all of these things throughout history. And so it does make us feel, uh, an intense emotion. It generates an emotional response, uh, simply because it is a, uh, monumental or historic, uh, site. Um, and a lot of times these places are, the sites of, uh, atrocities. Um, you know, many of them are, are total institutions. So, uh, places where people have been confined involuntarily, uh, whether it's an asylum or a prison, uh, you know, there are places that have, um, been the place of, of a lot of abuse and, you know, a lot of deaths and, and murder and mayhem. And all of that is, is very scary. Just the reality of the history is scary to think about. Uh, and so when we're in that space and we're thinking about these atrocities, we can't help but uh, feel emotional about it, feel feel scared about it, about getting that close to 
uh, to, you know, evil to the, to the dark side of, of humanity. Um, and, uh, that, you know, that, that is a, a very real kind of scary thing. Um, but even, you know, outside of the total institutions, places like churches, places that, uh, have some sort of, um, spiritual background, uh, they are also going to get us into that, that headspace of thinking about, um, the afterlife, thinking about death, thinking about what happens after we die, uh, things that we are not that comfortable thinking about. And so by going to, to these places, either to, to look for ghosts or even to just tour them, uh, it allows us to engage with a lot of this darker kind of content, uh, in a way that, um, maybe isn't confronting it exactly head on. You know, so it, it gives us a little bit of a distance. It, it provides sort of this protective frame that we can think about death. We can think about, uh, scary things without, uh, you know, actually going and, and, you know, going to a, a, an open prison <laughs> and, and witnessing it firsthand. Um, so, so they're emotional places. They're, they're places where we are, you know, going to have these very intense emotional experiences. And then when you add in the fact that many of them are, uh, are old and in a state of ruin, uh, that opens the, the door to lots of different environmental, uh, things that can, you know, generate, uh, vibration. So, you know, if you think about old HVAC systems, old, um, floorboards, things that can generate that 20, uh, hertz frequency below which we, we, we can't hear audibly, but our skin can pick it up. Our, uh, even our eyes can pick up those light vibrations and, uh, trigger our threat response and actually generate a feeling of uneasiness, of, um, you know, discomfort. The, the hairs on the back of our neck stand up, uh, because our body's picking up things in the environment that we're, uh, not cognitively aware of. In your paranormal um, travels, uh, now I'm, I doubt, I, I'm guessing that when, uh, the studies or at least your observations at, um, at the, the haunted locations, you're not going around and testing people's sweaty palms. But, no. <laughs> but, um, but I'm sure you are making some observations. Do you think now, and, and even as a believer, uh, I am not a skeptical per- person when it comes to this, but I am still convinced that 90% of what we experience when we go to these locations, I'm convinced is still stuff that a lot like you just described, but that we are scaring ourselves. We are misinterpreting much of the environment. Mm-hmm. Um, how much do you see that when you're, when you're out with the groups doing the investigation as a, as a pass, as a impartial bystander standing back, when you see them get really excited about some shadow they saw, how, yeah. how, throw a percentage out there. What, are we scaring ourselves in these places? We're definitely scaring ourselves and, 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 you know, and it doesn't rule out the existence of ghosts. You know, that, that could, that's, you know, I'm just waiting for more advances in, in technology so that we can get some really, uh, you know, good, accurate testing out there. Um, but the, the ability for us to kind of work ourselves up into a, um, very scared state is, uh, it's, in this type of environment, it's really easy. And then, uh, what it's called is the, the misattribution of arousal. So we start thinking that, you know, the, um, the physical responses that we're experiencing instead of being due to the environment and being with, you know, friends and, and doing something that is very exciting, like, you know, looking for ghosts. Um, you know, we think that it, that those feelings are because of a, a ghost present rather than, um, just what happens when we're with our friends and, and, and doing, uh, something fun and exciting and, and an adventure. I mean, I have these investigations are so much fun because, you know, it's exciting to look for ghosts. It's exciting to explore an area to, um, you know, go into dark places. And that's, we're, we're so hardwired to kind of be curious and investigatory and to, to look for things. And that feels good. And it does get our arousal systems going. I, I definitely agree there. Um, now, personally, personally, have you, because I'm still picturing you as a, I don't want to say uh, impartial bystander, but I guess that's a good word for it. Um, in the haunted locations that you've been in, 
Have you experienced anything that made you uh, either take a step back and say, hey, while this place might be hunted, or at least something that you just could not attribute to an environmental factor? I mean, ha- have you had that, you may be not that seminal experience, but some stuff that would drive your curiosity even further into the paranormal? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I wrote, actually, there's a whole chapter, uh, in my book about the, um, the paranormal investigation at Eastern State where I really did feel like I had a a paranormal experience. I felt this whole body kind of tingling and, and, uh, I thought, oh my gosh, I think a ghost must have just walked through me. And, and it really, you know, it sent me on a whole new research path trying to figure out what had happened. And, um, you know, when I think about that moment, I think, oh, gosh, you know, it was a very intense moment. We were all standing outside of a, a dark cell. Uh, we were just completely quiet in a state of intense um, focus and and just listening. And it was just quiet. And the 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 intensity of it was so high that I think uh, – I was experiencing more of a, of a kind of connection and bond with everybody that I was with. And, you know, I mean, for all I know, you know, there could have been a ghost there, but, you know, I thought, well, there was this powerfully emotional experience with, you know, people that I felt very close to. And, um, there's something about, you know, being very focused in the dark, <laughs> uh, when you're listening and you basically have blocked out all other stimulation, your body is still, kind of processing and running. And so it's going to, uh, to, to your, your sensations are heightened. You're in this heightened sensation state. Um, and you know, so I did feel in that moment, like this is something that is very different that I had not experienced before. Um, and that was very cool. Uh, and you know, I can, uh, explain it all with, with, you know, research and stuff, but there is a part of me that does like to think that maybe there was something a little extra happening there. Um, and it is a, a moment that I, you know, will never forget that I do think was, it was really a, a, a very cool moment for me. Now, um, you are speaking at the uh, upcoming event. What do you try to cover in, in, uh, your, um, seminar? So this, uh, this speaking, um, seminar will be focused on, uh, the science behind, uh, experiencing a sensed presence or when, you feel like there's something else in the room with you. Uh, so I'll be talking about what new research with fMRI and uh, EEG has shown uh, is happening in people's brains when they are stating that they're experiencing that kind of sensed presence because they, they have done a few studies uh, with people who uh, you know report these spiritual moments or uh, report to be psychic and uh, or mediums. Um, you know, we, we have data on them now, which is very cool. And we can see that, you know, in terms of what their brain is doing, it is different than normal everyday cognitive functioning. There is, there is difference in, uh, in brain state, uh, when people go into those, um, uh, experiences. So, so I'll be talking about that and what parts of the brain are associated with that. The, the temporal lobe, uh, is highly associated with this, uh, uh, kind of feeling like there's there's somebody in the room with you, and that's the part of our brain that is um, uh, responsible for awareness of our body, of where we are in space. And and what we're seeing is that sometimes when there's disruptions in that part of the brain, it can make us feel like we are outside of ourselves or there is something else in the room with us. Um, and so I'll talk about that and uh, and just kind of the the intersection of. Uh, of our brain and our body and what can happen to make us feel like we're not alone, you know, that, that there is a, a paranormal, uh, presence with us. Um, and so it's just, it doesn't, and I, you know, th- this is just sharing what, uh, kind of academics have collected on it. And I think that that's really, uh, fun and really good to kind of get out there into the paranormal world, um, so that, you know, it's just more information to kind of add to the pile. Like, okay, you know, is it this, is it that? Um, have we thought about what kind of environmental things might be going on? So it really is just more information for people who are going out and, and looking into this type of stuff. Everyone, you're listening to Paranormal Filler. One more segment with Margie, and we'll be right back. Every 
Friday night, Scarefest Radio. Dude, run! Join us every week as your hosts go behind the scenes of America's premier horror and paranormal convention, The Scarefest. Here's Johnny! You will be hearing from celebrities, speakers, artists, entertainers, and some of the most unique vendors anywhere. I am your father. Every week we will be giving away a three-day pass to a lucky listener. I'm afraid. That's the Scarefest Radio. Friday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern on ScarefestRadio.com. Welcome back to the final segment of Paranormal Filler. My guest tonight is sociologist Margie Kerr. Okay, Margie, um, now we'll get a little more personal. Not really. It's not really (laughs) personal. Um, what, 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 what's, I I guess I'll say what scares you, but, uh, let's start with what type of, um, scary movies do you like? Uh, Are you more into the thriller, the slasher? What, what, uh, raises your bristles? I really like, uh, I, I, you know, I like such a wide variety of scary movies. I just saw the, the witch, the pre-screening, uh, it comes out on February 19th and I got to go to a pre-screening of it and it was amazing. And, uh, and that, and that was a very different type of scary movie. Typically I like the kind of comedy horror, um, you know, big fan of the, uh, uh, cabin in the woods and, um, you know, Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, like very fun kind of slapstick, mm-hmm. uh, older B kind of horror movies. But The Witch is, I mean, that, that movie is very serious in that it could be a, a standalone period piece. It's so historically accurate. It's about, uh, the, um, uh, puritanical times, uh, and, uh, uh, it was terrifying for, um, you know, non-horror related reasons. So it's terrifying to think about what life was like during the, uh, the 1600s and how difficult it was just to survive. And so it was a heavy movie, but then it had some amazing startle scares, some really good, uh, kind of slow burn, slow build up scares. I like the, the scary movies that are, um, kind of a slow burn like that when it's more serious, when it's not a comedy horror and it's just this slow and antagonizing build towards kind of the apocalypse. Uh, I think that that's really fun because a lot of, the fun for me is in the anticipation, you know, even like with alien, I'm fine not seeing the, the monster. I like not, not knowing what, uh, what is about to be revealed. That's the, the kind that I like. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I find a lot of value in, in lots of different types of horror movies. Um, typically I'm not really a fan of things that are, uh, like overly gross, not a fan of things like human centipede, uh, um, the the ones with a lot of body modification and things like that don't typically uh get to onto my Netflix list but uh I like um you know the um there was the one um something Mandy Moore who killed Mandy Moore or something and and that was or Mandy Lane and I, I that was not a movie I would typically uh you know go for and it was great it was a great horror movie so so yeah I like a lot of them now, now, I believe you said something earlier about um, you've done a lot of things that people generally consider scary. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. What's yeah, I would the, say so. <laughs> okay, so it's you know, skydiving and crap like that. What's the yeah. scare? What? I, what was? Um, I'm going to ask this in two parts. What was the thing that you've done that you were most afraid to do? And then what experience really was the most frightening at the time? Um, let's see, most afraid to do. I guess when the, the CN Tower, uh, in Toronto, they have the edge walk and I wasn't afraid to, to do it until I stepped out onto the platform. Then I immediately became afraid and I wasn't expecting that because I'm, not really afraid of heights, uh, but as soon as I step foot out uh, and look down the 1,700 feet or something insane like that, um, I uh, immediately froze. I just was was terrified. Um, so that was that was that was actually very um, exciting to find out because I just was not expecting it at all. Uh, but I my body just went into a complete freeze mode. 
Um, so, so that was, uh, that was probably the most physically afraid that I, uh, that I have felt, uh, in terms of things that I kind of separate into the real fear, definitely don't want to do that again. Um, I've, you know, I, I've lived in a lot of, uh, violent neighborhoods and have had my share of, uh, you know, dangerous encounters that, um, are not fun. <laughs> um, so, uh, so those have, those have been some, some pretty scary experiences. I also was in, uh, Bogota. I went to Colombia, uh, for two weeks and got lost in, um, a notoriously bad area and, uh, nothing bad happened to me, but it was, uh, one of those instances where I definitely was scaring myself, imagining what could happen, uh, rather than the reality. So, um, so yeah, so that's, I, I guess those, those experiences. Um, you're obviously braver than I am to even, uh, attempt a couple of those. The, the Bogota thing would scare me to death. Being yeah. lost in an unfamiliar place. My, my biggest phobia, I think, is, um, being alone in almost any situation. I don't like being alone. I'm great when I'm with people, but, yeah. um, but I think that is, that is my, my greatest fear is, is truly being alone. Um, yeah. okay. Let's get the plugs in here at the end. Um, okay. First of all, everybody to find her, it's margiekerr.com and that is M-A-R-G-E-E kerr.com. Uh, there you can find a link to her book which is Scream, Chilling Adventures in the Science of Fear. And, of course, um, on the upcoming events, I've got Spirits of the Bay at Manresa Castle. Uh, that's March 11th through the 14th in Port Townsend, Washington. Uh, you can uh, catch a link to that at paranormalfiller.com. Anything else on the horizon, Margie, that you want to plug? Um, let's see. Uh, well, I'll be speaking at a conference in Chicago, uh, <laughs> but it's a academic conference for the Society for Affective Disorders. Hey, I might have smart people to listen. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and yeah, just probably popping around the, the U.S. doing different types of, uh, speaking engagements. I go to a lot of libraries, so <laughs> check out your local library. <laughs> Well, Margie, I want to thank you for coming on. It's been a lot of fun and uh, quite rather informative uh, talking to you. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And everyone, this has been Paranormal Filler. Uh, If you're listening live on WHDRadio.com, stay tuned. We'll be back in a few minutes with Spooky Scotty. Spooky Scotty.